Hey guys, welcome, welcome. We are about to get started. So welcome into our killer EKGs talk. I just realized the sun is all over my face. I hope you guys can see me. Welcome, welcome in. Really, really super excited. We're gonna go ahead and make sure that everything's running well and make sure that we are streaming. So let me see if I can find us in the group. We're gonna be streaming into the five-day EKG Facebook group. So if you get a chance and you wanna follow along, that's where we're gonna be. Um, this is gonna be a talk that is dedicated to getting you guys comfortable with some new data that just came out in October with some really scary killer EKG findings. So that's what we're gonna focus on tonight. We're gonna to focus on how to um, find these, we're gonna describe them, and we're gonna make sure that you walk away after this class armed and ready to go find them. So welcome in you guys. I'm really super excited you're here. My name is Jen Carlquist, and I think we are almost ready to officially get kicked off. But while we're waiting in the chat, can you guys type um, for me? Uh, a lot of you are on Zoom and I love it. Thank you for being on Zoom. Can you type in the chat for me what your practice setting is? Do you work in clinic? Do you work in ER, hospital, ambulance? What kind of setting do you work in? And I think we are now live in the Facebook group. Yes, we are. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, so this is, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get kicked off just a little bit early because um, my voice is a little bit froggy and I wanna make sure while I have it, I can uh, make sure to get you guys the data. So let's get kicked off with killer EKGs. Now, this is the first time that we've met each other. Hello, um, I'm Jen Carlquist and I'm a PA in cardiology and in emergency medicine. And I'm really excited today because I'm gonna share with you some things that just came out in the data that are groundbreaking and, and potentially could alter your practice. And I hope it does alter your practice. So yes, Chris, Zoom, um, emergency medicine. This is gonna be actually the most relevant for you, believe it or not. So, um, but it is relevant to people who work in the clinic as well. And that's why I'm really um, pleased that you guys showed up. This is gonna be definitely worth your time. Okay, so if you're on, Facebook, go ahead and type what kind of practice setting you're in, and let's go ahead and get kicked off. Welcome in, you guys. All right, so just a little bit of what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about why reading EKGs is high risk, and, and the biggest reason, and I'll just answer that now, is because the machine software doesn't always interpret the data correctly for us. In fact, it's wrong about 6 to 42% of the time. So do you have a 6 to 42% miss rate? Because I know I don't, right? And the other part of that is that we aren't taught what we need to know about EKGs in school. Honestly, nobody is, not doctors, not cardiologists. It doesn't matter where you work or who you are, you do not get enough education and it's not anybody's fault. It's just because things are changing and there's, there's too much um, content basically. So what we don't know really can hurt us. Hi, Sarah, welcome in. And we're going to talk about what you really should spend your time on and what maybe you don't need to spend so much time on. And <clears throat> I just kind of wanted to take a minute and step back to what I was taught in school, because remembering that I was looking back today, like, why, why did they teach me one at a time STEMI? And what I mean by that is only one artery at a time, right? Because sometimes multiple vessels are occluded at the same time. And if you're never taught that, you don't know what it looks like. I was taught on day one about vectors and that's practical, right? If you're gonna lay information down on top of it, it's practical, but it got me intimidated and I didn't wanna keep going after that. So I think if I were to do this differently and if you're new in practice, then, then I would tell you to, or if you're new in learning, focus your time on things that matter that are high risk. Okay, vectors are not something that are super critical and important. Vectors and actives. Okay, we should spend our time on the high risk EKG findings the machine's gonna miss. So we also wanna spend some time um, on these basics. Now these are numbers here, these are called the intervals. And I feel like we don't get enough training on these numbers. Now, let me ask you guys, how many of you use these numbers? How many of you guys use these numbers? I was told in school that these numbers are for the cardiologist, not for me. I don't need to use them. But in reality, this is the set of numbers that's gonna to start to tell me 
things like I have a bundle branch block, right? So a wide QRS over 120. And you can see over here, there's a left bundle in V1. Okay, the machine even tells us there's a left bundle. That's not gonna happen if you don't read these numbers. And then heart box and all sorts of other things, prolong QT, it all matters. And so you need to spend some time knowing the normal intervals, right? So if you're taking notes, take a quick um, couple of numbers down so that you have the normals on hand. The ventricular rate should be 60 to 100. The PR interval should be 120 to 200. The QRS should be less than 120. And the QTC should be less than 460 milliseconds. Okay, those are the big numbers to know. And if they're not, then go look to see what's wrong. So for example, this is someone that had something wrong with her intervals. Does anybody know? Just from pattern recognition, now we don't have the numbers up here on purpose because the other part of this is actually recognizing the high risk pattern. So if you guys have been with me at all for any length of time, then you know I'm a big fan of the um, mom, dad, baby. And I'm just gonna revisit that really quick in case you've never seen any of my talks then I'm gonna kind of show you what I mean. So if you look at the P, the P is the mom, the curious is the dad, and the T wave is the baby. And hopefully you've spotted by now. Yes, Anoop spotted it, the problem. You should have your baby standing really close to the dad and he's not, okay? So he's far away, so this is a prolonged QT. And this patient did have cardiac arrest because she was on multiple QT prolonging medications. So at the end of the day, this is someone who, had cardiac arrest because she was on multiple QT prolongers and nobody did a medication reconciliation. So literally this is something that could have been prevented. So knowing the numbers, right, over 460 and also being able to spot the high risk pattern being that the baby is far from the dad is super critical. And these are just the basics, right? There's actually a lot of other things that we need to know that they didn't teach us. So let me ask you guys, how many hours did you get in school to learn EKGs? Okay, how many hours? Can you type in the chat? And then also, if you wanna type how many hours it takes to really be safe or how long on what you guys think about that, I'd love to hear your, your opinions on that. But I think when I looked back, I got like four hours of school total on EKGs. And I remember if I didn't have what I had as a paramedic background, I think I would have been really lost and um, in PA school. And I know that my, NP and my PA colleagues, they all um, were, were freaking out because a lot of them didn't have the background. And honestly, it's a lot. So we don't get enough training and it really does take a long time to be safe. But I think that we could shorten that duration if we know how. Thank you, Tanya. Tanya says maybe three hours. I know, girl. So if we could figure out a way to maybe maximize getting these high risk findings into our brain quickly, that is the key. Now, unfortunately, unfortunately, the ACC just made our life a little bit harder. In my opinion though, it's good because this is something I've been teaching for a long time, but now the ACC is finally sort of uh, backing up what I've been teaching. But they are now telling us there's more things to look for that can cause death in a patient that the machine won't miss. So it completely, basically in October, revised the guidelines to um, tell you what to look for on the EKG, that things are that are concerning for ischemia. So now we have a whole other set of things to potentially learn. So this was just, this is um, actually the name of the document that was just released in October last month. And this is kind of their flow chart from their website and this article. And I, I have a link in like two slides that you can actually go to it if you want to look at it. It's a really good article. But basically, they're talking about STEMI or STEMI equivalent. Obviously, we know what to do with that. But they're also saying other findings concerning for acute ischemia or infarction, and they give you an asterisk. Well, I actually pulled that table out for you, and I'm going to show it to you guys so you know what findings that they think are concerning for infarction. And the problem is, is we're only taught in school. Here's the gap, okay? We're taught STEMI, 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 normal. Here's a few abnormals, but all that stuff in between, we're not taught. I think that's a huge problem because now the ACC is holding us publicly accountable to know these things, right? And honestly, it's something we should have known all along. Hey, Tommy, what's going on? 
we should have known it all along, right? But I'm going to show you what they are so you can kind of, you can figure out where to focus your energy, okay? So as you know, right, ST segment elevation in ADR is bad with widespread ST depression, okay? Well in sign is also something bad. This is something that's right fresh in their guidelines, okay? So we need to be able to identify these things for sure. And then we also need to spot T wave inversion. Now a T wave inversion is a T wave that's upside down where it shouldn't be upside down, okay? Um, ooh, inpatient cardiology, Sherry, nice, welcome in. Um, so yeah, these are, these are things that Sherry probably knows a lot about <laughs> for sure, but it's unfortunately, you know, this was written for acute chest pain in the ER, like a decision pathway guideline, but you know what? Unfortunately, sometimes patients come to primary care with chest pain. Sometimes they come to urgent care. And this document addresses all the things like troponin, what to get, when to get it, um, you know, what imaging to get, who's safe to send home. But we're just going to talk about today the EKG portion. Okay. And, you know, unfortunately, this document was written just for guidance in the ER. But if you don't work in the ER, this still applies to you because you still have to be able to catch those findings and know who to refer to the ER and who can wait for outpatient cardiology. And that I know is honestly one of the hardest things that you struggle with every single day. Okay, I know that because a lot of you have, I've met you on the road on, on conferences or you've messaged me and you've said, Jen, I, wor I don't know when to worry about the EKG. I know the big stuff, but it's that little stuff I'm worried about. Well, you're actually correct to be worried about that little stuff because this is a patient that came to clinic. Yeah, not the ER. And he had a STEMI five minutes after this EKG was taken. So literally it is these very small minutia details that matter. So does anybody wanna take a stab on, on why you think, what, what was the pre-STEMI indicator here? And thinking back, I'm gonna tell you that it just said, and if you've heard me talk before, you guys know how I feel about the STT of abnormality blanket statement from the machine. It's something the machine says, but it's a blanket. Like the machine doesn't know what's wrong, but it knows it's not a STEMI. So it's this garbage can place that it puts things that are not normal, but it doesn't know what to call them. This is where the danger lives. This is where. So if you see that, there are several things you need to make sure you're not missing. And I'm going to show you that list in a second. But if anybody, I don't think anybody typed in the chat for me yet, um, what they thought was going on. Okay, good. M Melissa says T wave inversion. I like that. You're so right. So getting back to the T waves here. Yeah, they're a problem. And you can see that they are inverted over here. Okay. And the, the guidelines just told us that's something to worry about, right? Totally agree with you. So good pickup on your part, Melissa. And also um, somebody says Brigada and actually I totally see why you say that. And I love that you're thinking about Brigada because Brigada is actually even on my shirt. I wore a shirt with Brigada for you guys today. But um, Brigada, this isn't Brigada and Brigada doesn't lead to STEMI and it'll have like a upslope and downslope like that, but it's not that, okay? There actually is something going on in those leads, however. And actually Tommy says lateral ischemia. Awesome, you are so right, Tommy. Um, but the bigger thing, is that this patient has too big of a T wave here. So V2 and V3 are too big. Does anybody know the name of that? The, what they call that in the ACC guideline? Because this is one of the things that we need to look for that's concerning for ischemia. And obviously this is a sometimes a STEMI equivalent, to be honest with you, someone that needs urgent PCI. And this is what happens pre-STEMI. Okay. There's other things on the CKG too we could talk about, but basically this is, um, this is the recommendation from the ACC. Okay. There's two recommendations I wanted to highlight for you today. Number one was um, the EKG should be examined for other changes. That is one of them. The one, the inverted symmetric T waves you just saw, that's one of those other changes. And those two big T waves that are called hyperacute, those are also something that we should, that would prompt um, urgent angiography. Okay. So these two things, as you can see, we really need to know them. So if this isn't something that you feel comfortable with, right, this is something you obviously want to go back and review because 
it's in there black and white in our in it out there right for the lawyers to know we have to know this so now we have to do our part and actually learn it but before you get too afraid right they do say that it's okay to ask for an overread um, when there's lack of clear diagnostic criteria now i know that a lot of us don't have that but you know it's it's always a good idea if you're not sure if you're working outpatient and you think something's sketchy and you don't have any you know it doesn't look right but you're not sure um get someone else's eyes on it even if it's not a cardiologist right have maybe the doc you work with look at it if you're a medic send it to base have them look at it but don't just um shove it under the carpet and say oh those changes were non-specific i'll refer to cardiology because if we did that to that last guy he literally would have died so these are things the other things tips they recommend that can help you if you're stuck so one of those things is performing serial ekgs okay so serial ekgs will show you if there's a dynamic change in a short amount of time so if you potentially had somebody who was maybe you know uh, had a little bit of something funky and you weren't sure have them wait for five minutes and do a repeat ekg go see someone else in the next room if you have the room right and do another ekg and then also the last thing they wanted to mention and make sure we highlighted is that if you're suspicious of a posterior mi right um that you want to make sure to get a posterior ekg now that's easy to do you can just take v6 or sorry v4 v5 and v6 and move it over and do v7 v8 v9 on the back and rerun it and all you need to have is 0.5 millimeters of ST elevation. But what would you see on the front of the EKG? What would you see on the front of the heart to make you suspicious? What would you see? So type in the chat. Let's let's see if you guys know. Okay. Now, um, if you did know, great. If you don't, that's okay. I actually listed it here on the slide um, that you can see posterior STEMI. So you're looking for ST to pregnant ST depression in V2 and V3, especially, but also V1. So that would be a reciprocal change. And you need to have, um, again, that posterior EKG just have 0.5 millimeters um, in at least one lead of the V2 through V7 through V9, okay? But better if you have two. Now, there's also a whole nother big bucket of things, and this is called scarbosis criteria. This listed out for you here. We're not going to cover that today, obviously, but they're just saying that these are STEMI equivalents. So even though, even though, the machine is not going to list STEMI for us, we need to know these criteria. So if we have a left bundle branch block, that's when we would apply this criteria. Now, the two on the bottom are something that I really want to hammer home because this hyperacute T waves, remember we just saw that on that last EKG, that gentleman had hyperacute T waves in V2 and V3. Again, they're too big, they're too big for their QRS. And that gentleman went straight to the cath lab and because it was a V2 and V3, you would imagine that his LAD was occluded, and it was. So when you have big T waves, this is one of the things to think about. So they have a broad base and they're very big, but they're not too peaky, um, if that's a word, like hyperkalemic T waves are, okay? And then the other one is D winter sign. And I know that a lot of you have not have heard of this, this before, but 2% of LAD occlusions will present like this. Sometimes LAD dissections will present like this. Those are two things you wouldn't want to miss, but basically there's a big, um, you know, ST segment depression in V3 and V4, and it'll have a really big hyperacute T wave. So it almost looks like a motorcycle ramp. And then also when it said, remember on that guideline where it said consistent with acute ischemia, these are all the things, right? The hyperacute, Wellens, ST depression. And then of course, if you see ST elevation in ABR, with widespread ST depression, that's also something to look for. So as you can see, this is really guys, where if I, I could literally just tell you, you know, like I work in cardiology, I work in ER, I know the struggle, right? But this is where I would spend your time on this stuff because this is the stuff that the machine's never gonna say, but you're responsible to know. Can you see the power in knowing these, right? That would be huge. And yes, they're going to present. It doesn't matter where you are, they're going to find you. I first went into um, family medicine when I got out of school because I was like, yeah, I want some time to get my feet on the ground, you know, to make sure no sick people come and I can get super confident with my, my skills. And no, they still came. And I was quickly uh, left family practice and went to cardiology because I was like, if they're going to find me anyway, I might as well just go jump in the fire. All right, just go jump in the, the frying pan. So again, the machine won't help you 
it might tell you nonspecific, but that's not enough. So you need to know the winters. You need to know the ST depression in V2 and V3 means a posterior MI. And you need to know what Wellen's warning looks like. And of course, the ST elevation in AVR with the widespread depression. These are the things that will be labeled nonspecific. So focus your time learning those, okay? So there's also a thing they didn't list, but I wanted to visit with you real quick because it can be a killer in the way that if we don't pick it up, that unfortunately we might send them home and they, they could, because we were taught in school that Q waves are old MI. Well, not always. Sometimes Q waves are new MI. Within the first hour of an infarction, the Q wave can form. So how do you know if you're supposed to worry about it? Well, there's two ways. If they're pathologic, they're gonna be wide or they're gonna be deep, right? At least one third the height of the R waves. Some textbooks say a quarter, but either way, right? You want to make sure you scan your EKG for Q waves. And if they are some, or if they're contiguous in the same part of the heart, then we're gonna worry even more about them. So I threw that on there as well because sometimes that can burn you. So today's <laughs> killer EKGs, there's a lot of them. Um, but talking about Q waves for a second, you can see there's one here in lead three. Again, that's the first negative deflection and it's fairly deep. It's like half the size of the QRS. And this lady was 24 and her software said inferior infarction, old or unknown age, right? And they didn't know what to do with that because she had a lot of chest discomfort. Well, the answer to that was they admitted her and she ended up needing a stent. Now, if you're wondering why, it was because she had dialysis um, at 24. She was insulin dependent diabetic. And unfortunately she also had familial hyperlipidemia. So her heart age was a lot older, but I'm telling you guys, there is so much value in understanding that the Q can be new. The Q can be new, okay? And then this is also, just to show you another um, pre-indicator pre EKG, okay? Because these, these are so many of them, there's just not even enough time. But you can see here that this was an ambulance case, right? And the patient called for chest pain and the EKG said normal ECG. But it's not a normal ECG. In fact, um, there is a problem in AVL. The T wave is inverted. That's not normal. The T waves are supposed to be inverted in AVR and V1, and that's it. If they're inverted somewhere else, that's a sign of usually ischemia. There's three other things it could be, but usually ischemia. And knowing that the T wave in V1 should be inverted and it's not, these two things, the machine is telling us it's normal, but this guy, this is not of a normal EKG, okay? So again, just showing you the machine software is not always right. Now this happened at 1039, the guy was hooked up, but 1043, just four minutes later, he has now progressed into a STEMI. So this is exactly the reason why they recommend you to get serial EKGs if there's anything sketch, okay? I don't think they say anything sketch, but if there's anything sketch, just get a serial EKG and keep your finger on that pulse. Make sure that, you know, if you have a gut instinct about something, follow it up. It's your gut's trying to tell you something, okay? So this patient actually had an LAD occlusion that was fairly significant and ended up forming a new right bundle in the next EKG. And new right bundles or new left bundles can be a sign of an LAD occlusion. Okay, that's another thing just to kind of throw in your, the, the cap of things to learn. So here's a good news though. Even though we've talked about some findings that maybe you've never heard about before, there are a few things that you actually can get wrong and still be okay. I know it sounds weird for me to say that, right? But if you have an AFib and you call it a flutter or a flutter you call an AFib, that's not the end of the world. I mean, if, assuming that they have an elevated CHADS vasque and you anticoagulate them, what, so what? If you miss sinus arrhythmia and you don't call it and you call it, you know, maybe a sinus pause or something, not the end of the world, okay? If you miss a PAC or a PJC, again, not the end of the world. Nobody dies from that. If you miss that they have some LVH on their EKG, some left ventricular hypertrophy, again, nobody dies. But people do die if you don't pick up those findings that I listed on that slide from the ACC update. So as promised, I, 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 although I talked to you about some EKGs already, um, some findings, I did wanna just show you a few couple of cases really quick. Um, and I don't wanna make this too long, but as promised in Halloween, Hall, um, Halloween theme, 
uh, we're going to talk about some deadly EKG findings. So this is a case, um, some chest pain on this gentleman. Now, this is nobody's real face, of course. Um, but just to kind of set the scene now, this EKG I'm going to show you. Um, obviously, he he's looks you know, like he's in pain and chest pain for three days with, you know, a history of ex-smoking hypertension. Like he's a, he's a recipe for something to be bad, right? <clears throat> but this EKG is literally the reason why I feel so strongly also that we really need to get our pen and paper out. Or if you have an RCAT window badge or any sort of tool, you get it out and you use it. Because this EKG, the devil is in the details, okay? And what I mean by that is that you've got, you gotta know with absolute certainty, do you have ST elevation or depression? Do you have those? And if you do, are they in what's called contiguous leads and do they have reciprocal changes? So what do you guys think? Does this, now that I've drawn the lines for you, does this scream STEMI or does it not yet meet enough criteria? What do you guys think? Give me your thoughts. There's some elevation in three and F and a little bit in two. What do you guys think? So, and there's a little depression in one and AVL. All right. So yeah, this is indeed enough to be a STEMI, okay? Because two, three and F are contiguous, meaning fed by the same artery and one in AVL are indeed reciprocal to that. And you only need one box, one small box, one millimeter of ST elevation in, in two leads to be called STEMI. So this was indeed a STEMI. And yes, Tommy, you are very right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So this was a STEMI. And literally, guys, this is why I, I urge you to really scrutinize closely your EKGs so you don't miss this. Now, this is another scary EKG. Um, these look like tombstones here. And this is the machines calling it an acute STEMI. But actually, there's something, something else going on. This is not a STEMI. So again, the machine is not telling us the right answer. Um, and so we, Bria, what's up, girl? Um, so it looks like an inferior STEMI for sure. The last one did. This one may also fool you into thinking it's a STEMI, but this is not a STEMI. This was a patient who had hypothermia and unfortunately was very cold. That's what the artifact is from, the shivering. And one hour later, when the patient was warmed up, you can see that all the ST segment stuff went away, all right? So um, just know that you can't always rely on your machine. It will fail you. And that's why you have to know these findings. Now, other scary stuff, does anybody wanna take a guess on what happened to this guy or why did he go into cardiac arrest based on his x-ray? I know this is not a EKG or it's not an x-ray class, but this patient does have something that is concerning. And he, he literally coded two minutes after this was taken. So anybody have a, an idea what happened here? Well, this is a water bottle heart. It's too big. And the patient has an effusion, okay? And this effusion led to tamponade, which led to death, okay? So this was his comparison. You can see he has some new hardware from a cabbage. And he unfortunately um, did not make it. Yes, Bria, pericardial effusion. And if you saw this EKG, this is what he would have had during that x-ray. This is what it would have looked like. And this finding is another killer finding called electrical alternance, where you have a big beat, small beat, big beat, small beat, big beat, small, big beat, small, okay? So that's the heart coming towards you and going away from you. So this is something that also you wanna just have on your radar as we're talking about super scary EKGs. Okay, this is a zebra. Um, hopefully you're not seeing this in the clinic. If you are, you're calling 911 and keeping them alive. All right, now this is something I wanted to throw in under the scary EKGs because the widening of the QRS, the widening of the QRS is being caused by hyperkalemia of 8.3. And some people think that this looks very similar to VTAC. Some people may want to cardiovert this patient, but we have to always think about hyperkalemia with these wide complex tachycardias. And this is gonna develop into what is very lethal and is known as a sine wave, S-I-N-E. So hopefully we've, um, I have one more EKG to show you um, and I haven't scared you too much, but this is another guy with indigestion. And so looking at his software interpretation, it says 
that he has some nonspecific STT wave changes. All right, so we're like, ah, oh, I hate when you say that. So you look over here and he's got depression in V2 and V3. And what we learned about this is that that is concerning for a posterior MI. So this is a guy where if you were unsure, you could do a V7, V8, and V9 and make sure he has some reciprocal changes in the back and you see his, his elevation, okay? It only has to be half of a small box to be considered significant, okay? So now we've covered <clears throat> posterior EKG and when to get one. We've covered um, some other scary stuff as well. Um, but you have to always remember that we're not looking at the whole heart. We're not looking at the whole heart. So the posterior wall, we're not looking at unless we dedicate and move the leads. So that's why you have to understand that this 3D object is representing itself on a flat piece of paper. And I think that's where the disconnect comes. Hey, Michelle, she's live from Houston. That's where the disconnect comes because it's really hard to conceptualize the fact that I don't understand how the 3D object comes together with the paper. But if you can understand that everything on the front, everything that happens on the front, the opposite is gonna happen on the back and vice versa. That's why if you're having an infarction in the back, UCSD depression and V2 and V3, which are up here. So if you can just wrap your mind around that and understand contiguous and reciprocal leads, it really makes your life easier in conceptualizing this. So the list um, I showed you earlier, I wanted to add a couple more things to your list if you're gonna go study and really buckle down to make sure that you know this. We talked about hyperkalemia a little bit. There's actually five things for hyperkalemia that signs that hyper-K can show you. We talked a little bit about STEMI mimics. We talked about an Osborne wave, but there's a bunch more. We talked about pericardial effusion and tamponade. Luckily you saw the electrical alternans. Um, we showed you that the machine can say it's normal, but it's not. So in other words, the buck stops with you, right? Or if not you, then somebody above you, because the key is you just don't want to send somebody home with an EKG that has one of these bad things. And then they, you refer them to cardiology and they wait three weeks to get in and they die in the meantime, because that's bad form. That's bad for us. Um, if we do that, bad for the patient, right? And we all got into this to save lives. So unfortunately with the landscape changing, we just need to stay up on the new content. So I would say though, spend most of your time here on the things that it'll say non-specific STT wave changes and really get comfortable with that. So you know confidently what those are and what those patterns look like. And our coach, David White, he often says that EKGs, they look like faces to him. And once you learn those faces, you never miss them again. So it really is kind of a memorization of bad patterns, which I think is super helpful. Okay, and then of course, the two things that kill young people, Brugada and Hokum. Okay, so is there a way to, to kind of condense that time? And, and maybe just, you know, I'm busy. Can I just learn a little bit of this each day? and take it into little bite-sized pieces? Well, yes, actually now there is. What we did was we put together um, a 14-day EKG challenge that actually starts today in a separate Facebook group. And you get an access to each of these little lessons broken down into very short concepts because we know that I work in the ER. I don't have a long attention span. I can't watch long videos. I can't sit for a long time and process. I need things in bite sizes. So I literally put this together with that in mind and each day there's something new. So day one, today the video that is released in the group is the waves. You can watch it whenever you want, it's already there. And tomorrow rhythm review will come out. The next day, normal EKG will come out, right? Next day, 10 steps to reading an EKG. Next day, EKG terms, right? And then we're gonna focus on day six, reciprocal changes in contiguous leads. And then the two high risk findings, Brigada and Hokum on day seven, we'll cover those. On day eight, we talk about what it looks like to use a chief complaint-based approach. Day nine, we have a whole half an hour. That one's a little long because we're going to show you all those non-specific STT wave changes. We're going to show you what they look like and cover them. We're going to talk about STEMI identification and actually the two up, two down, all the criteria. And then we're going to talk about subtle STEMI and then STEMI mimics. And then day 13 and 14, we have a case for you to solve. But that's not even the best part. Because the best part is that Coach Michelle, and hopefully you've met her before, she's been with us for over two years, and I love her so much. She and I are going to do a co-workshop together for you. So you're going to get the recorded daily sessions 
launch in your in your portal, but also in the Facebook group. You're going to get to watch those, and then on the seventh and eighth, we're going to do um, some, some some Zoom lessons like this, where we'll go into breakouts and do a workbook for the last half hour. So November seventh, which is a Monday, November eighth, which is a Tuesday, we're going to meet like this on Zoom at five thirty Pacific Standard, and it'll be recorded. And then we'll go into the Zoom rooms with our workbooks that are already uploaded into the group waiting for you. So we're going to take what we talked about today and just expand on it, but we're going to actually go back for these two sessions to the basics. So we're going to do, um, obviously, as I said, two through 16, you get a little mini lesson in the group each day, but then you also get the breakout sessions and the, the day of the seventh, we're going to do basic 12 lead. And we have a whole workbook for you that we're going to go through together. And we're going to do basic arrhythmia on the eighth. So that's super, super exciting. And then on the 16th, we're going to do a wrap up with a Q&A and you can get in with us for only $49. So if you want to take advantage of this and get in on it, all you got to do is go to, it's actually cardiologymadeeasy.net. There's no period here, cardiologymadeeasy.net, hash or best space 14 days, and you can get in and jump in with us. You can actually um, email me if you need the link, if, if you're not able to click it from here. But um, this is a session that I'm really excited to bring to you because I'm going to be able to give you instant access. Once you sign up, you'll get instant access to the portal. And if you want to learn what we talked about tonight in detail, just go to day nine. Go right there and watch day nine. And then we'll send you the Zoom links for our special private Zooms where we're going to do the workshops with me and Michelle, focusing on the basics and arrhythmias. And that's going to be super exciting. So I can't wait to see you guys inside. I'm currently inviting you in. Um, we're not going to do this again anytime soon. So if you want to jump on this little bite-sized morsel type lesson, um, definitely grab this. And um, this is actually the website without any period. So it's cardiologymadeeasy.net, 14 days, okay? And what you'll do is you'll click I want in, and then you'll actually uh, jump in the portal. And all the lessons are already there should you want to watch them all and binge watch them. But of course, they're going to drop each day um, in the Facebook group at eight o'clock in the morning and you'll get to watch them. And so you can spend just a little bit of time every day and it doesn't expire, you'll get to watch them. You'll have lifetime access to your portal. So it's not like it's gonna go away. So that's the good thing, but it's designed to, for people who are ADHD like me and need the um, small doses. Um, all right, so tonight's prize, um, that is something that I'm super excited about too. So first of all, uh, we're gonna give away a 20 minute session with me one-on-one -on -one to work on anything you want EKG related. Okay, so how many do people wanna sign up to possibly win this? Okay, so um, I'm gonna give you guys a hashtag and you're not gonna put it in today, you're gonna put it in tomorrow because we have a bonus lecture for you guys tomorrow. We have uh, Joe who's coming in, who is gonna do killer arrhythmias for you tomorrow night. And it's gonna be like an arrhythmia snack. And he's going to come on tomorrow in the group live, just like this and on Zoom. And he's going to present all the fun arrhythmia stuff. So I know you guys have seen him before and you love him. Um, he's the RN and director at Chart Healthcare Academy. So he's going to be presenting a little bit deeper on the arrhythmias than, than we will in our workshop. But that's going to be so cool because he's his graphics are amazing. So come tomorrow night for his lecture. And when you guys get on his lecture, the hashtag you're going to put in to be entered to win for the prize is you're gonna put hashtag Jen, okay? Not tonight, but tomorrow on his live feed, put that in and I'll be coming on to draw the winner um, probably on, not tomorrow, but the next day. And I'll tell you who the winner is, but definitely jump in with us today because the first video is already dropped in the group for you, ready and waiting. And Michelle and I are excited to have you in our seventh and eighth class and do the breakout sessions because I've been hammering out those workbooks and they're gonna be so much fun. And Michelle and I can't wait to see you guys in that class. So thank you guys for coming. We're going to post the replay of this for you guys. Anybody who signed up on Zoom will get the replay. And then, of course, they'll be in your Facebook group um, that you can rewatch at any time. But you guys have a great evening. Thank you for coming on with Killer EKGs. And if you have questions, you can drop them in the feed. And I'll see you guys hopefully in the 14-day EKG challenge. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.